for I sought to pray together. Heavenly Father, we bless your name for your goodness. We thank you for the plan of salvation. And we thank you because you make us to hear the gospel, the good news. The good news that comes to tell us how to find the way to life. Eternal life, everlasting life. We're praying, Lord, tonight you open the pages of the scriptures to everyone once again in Jesus' name. I will pray that your blessing will abide upon the teaching of the word. And those of us who hear will apply the word to our hearts and lives in Jesus' name. We pray that we will not be hearers of the word only. We will be doers of the word in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. As we come to the third study of um, John, that is the first epistle of John. We're coming back to chapter 1, John, 1st John chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 7 all through to verse 10. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. And his word is not in us. As we look at those verses of scripture, it appears that for people that go to church once in a while, those verses, especially verses 8 and 9, are very familiar with them. Yet many people do not understand those verses of scripture. Very great, very gracious, those words are. And they reveal the all-sufficient provision of God brought through Christ to all mankind, to sinners and saints alike. God's bountiful and merited favor is brought out in clear terms. As you look at those words, the beauty, the bounty, the clarity, the simplicity will strike you to understand that this is not something you can overlook. As we come to chapter 1 verse 7, it says, but if we walk in the light, it's told us that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And I already explained and emphasized that what light, when it says God is light, it means that it's all love, it's all bright, it's all glorious, it's all joyful, it's all happy, and it's all truthful. Because light is uh, taken for knowledge and holiness and purity and righteousness. Now it says, if God is light and you claim to have fellowship with God, you will walk in the light. If you are walking in darkness, you do know the truth and the truth of the word is not in you. It says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light. It's talking about uh, now Christ who came to show us the life that a child of God ought to live. He is the very son of God. And he came to reveal the father unto us. He came to demonstrate the father unto us. And the Bible says no man has seen God at any time. It is full glory. It is full beauty. For the son of God Jesus Christ has come to reveal him. Look at the way Jesus lived. Because Jesus emphasized to you, I am the light of the world. But you remember Jesus also said that you are the light of the world. You get the light from him. And the light of Christ reflects through your life. Let your light so shine therefore that men may see your good works and glorify your father who is in heaven. That's what he means here. We walk in the light. We walk in the truth. We'll walk in the light, we'll walk in righteousness. We'll walk in the light, we're walking in holiness. We'll walk in the light, we're walking in purity. If you walk in the light, as he is in the light, it gives us 
the perfect example where to follow. Where to follow his steps. We're not to make excuses and say, so and so I read about in the Bible did not always walk in the light. Sometimes their languages are shady. Their utterances are shady. Sometimes they, they actually didn't walk in the bright light of the revelation of the word of God. They qualified things. They were hypocritical. They sometimes lied and all. It says, don't compare yourself to that. If we walk in the light as he Christ is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And it's not just talking I explained to you when we studied that passage. It's not talking of, you know, I smile at you and you smile at me and we shake hands together. I would say we're in fellowship together. No, the Bible makes it clear very much. What we're to do with one another that demonstrates fellowship. And what we're not to do to one another with one another that demonstrates fellowship. And I spelled it out for you. F-E-L-L, that's double L-O-W-S-H-I-P. Fellowship. F there means to forgive each other. Forbear with each other. You cannot say you're in fellowship with each other. You're not walking in the light. If there's no forgiveness in your heart, no forgiveness in your action, no forgiveness in your attitude, bear one with another. It's not just that you are living under the same roof, husband and wife. You forgive each other. You bear with each other. And he there is to exhort one another. As you see the days approaching, exhort one another, edify one another. You are not uh, throwing down, stamping down, or trampling down on other people. You're lifting them up. You're edifying them. You're challenging them. You're charging them. You're making them enthusiastic and happy to walk in the narrow way that leads to heaven. It is to love one another. And Jesus said, by this shall all men know that she here, my disciples, you are walking in the light, you will walk in love, and you love one another, even as I have loved you. The next L there is to be like minded to the Lord Jesus Christ, because it's a Jesus Christ. He came and he humbled himself, and he says, We ought to follow his steps. We're like minded, and we observe the word of God. We cannot say we're in fellowship with one another. First of all, you must be in fellowship with God. How are you in fellowship with God? You observe the word of God without partiality and that is the fellowship the Lord is calling us to and then he says W they are one each other you see your brother going astray you'll not be clapping for him and encouraging him say that, that's right that's right keep on fighting keep on doing evil you want them because the day of judgment reckoning is approaching and you weep with those who weep of course they are sorrowful you are sorrowful with them and they are going through some turbulent times and challenges you're going through turbulent times and challenges with them. You weep with the people that weep. And then S is to serve one another. And you serve with the best of your ability, best of your skill, and best of your learning and experience. That's fellowship. When you're able to forgive and forget, and you're able to forbear with each other, when you're able to edify and exhort other people, when you're able to love, and you're, able, and you're like-minded to the Lord Jesus Christ, you observe the word of God, and you weep and warn other people and then you are serving and you are humble it says put on humility like a cloth and you wear it that your attitude can show that that's a humble person and you are, you are not proud against other people that's not fellowship when you are proud and boisterous and you look down on other people and, say, and they're like uh, rats before you and they're like rags before you that's, there's no fellowship there but when you can look at them you know something I don't know you can do something I cannot do whatever you know whatever you can do there's something that brother that sister can do that you cannot do because of that there's humility and then you intercede one for the other. That's fellowship. Somebody is in challenge, is a problem, is having some difficulties, and then you intercede one with another. Pray one for another that she may be of the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And then you prefer one, the other people above yourself. You're not thinking, I'm the center of gravity in this fellowship. I'm the one here. If they don't see me, if they don't know me, nothing else will go on. You prefer other people because God has brought us all together. And you cannot say, I don't have need of that. I don't have need of that brother or need of that sister. Of course you do. That's fellowship. And then now it says, if we 
Walk in the light. I see it's in the light. We have fellowship one with another. And then he says, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from our many sins, from all sin. And now here he says, uh, what John, the beloved, is telling us, he says, he cleanses us from all sin. There may be people that say, uh, I don't have any sin to be cleansed. I'm all right. Since I was born, I've never committed any sin. So that's a liar right there. Because the Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In fact, the Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 19, verse 20, that the whole world is guilty before him. That's why he now says, after he has said, the blood of Jesus that pure blood, that righteous blood, that spotless blood, without any blemish and without any sin. It says that blood will cleanse us from all sin. And then somebody says, if you then say, we have no sin, no sin to be cleansed. We have not done anything wrong since we were born. It says, you deceive yourself and the truth is not in us. What does that mean? The truth is not in us. The truth is that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The truth is that I was shaped in iniquity. In sin did my mother conceive me. The truth is even the stars are not clean in his sight. And how can you talk about the son of man that is born of a woman? Of course, all have sinned. And therefore, John is reminded in us, if you say, well, I don't need the blood of Jesus to be cleansed from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Then it comes now, it comes back to the people that are willing to confess and willing to forsake, willing to abandon their sin. And it says, if we confess our sins, it's not talking of confessing every day and every week and every Sunday. It's saying that you recognize your sin and then you come to the Lord. If we confess confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us. He forgives the sins of the past. You know, if you are going to for, you cannot forgive the sins of the future. You cannot call a person now and say, okay, I forgive you. The sin of yesterday, the sin of today, and the sin of tomorrow. I give you license before you even do anything at all. I've forgiven you for the rest of your life. You can't do that. You can only forgive the sins of the past. And so when you come to the Lord and you say, this is what I've done in the past. If we confess our sins, those sins we already know. That's what you can confess. Can you confess future sin? Can you confess? Are you telling the Lord, I'm going to steal, I'm going to commit adultery, I'm going to, you know, commit fornication, therefore I'm asking now for forgiveness? No, you don't do that. The sins of the past. What you've done to be wrong. This takes care of your past life. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us. And then he says to cleanse us. And to cleanse us. He forgives. That's where some people stop. Praise the Lord, I'm forgiven. Are you cleansed? Are you washed? Are you purged? Are you purified? I see broken the power of that sin that you did in the past. It's forgiving you. Praise the Lord, but he wants to do more than that. He will cleanse us from all sin. Look at verse 10. And many people don't understand the difference between verse 8 and verse 10. Here verse 10 now is saying, If we say we have not sinned, Look at verse 8. If we say we have no sin, that one is sin. If you say there's no sin to be cleansed, there's no sin to confess, and there's no sin to get rid of, there's no sin to put right. If you say we have, we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But now it comes to verse 10. Remember verse 9. You have confessed in verse 9. Remember in verse 9, you have been forgiven in verse 9. Remember in verse 9, you have been cleansed from all unrighteousness from verse 9 and now verse 10 after verse 9 says if we say we have not sinned that is if we come out of that prayer closet and we begin to brag that well yes i go to church yes i said something before the lord but i've never 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 seen since i was born that is it says if we say we have not we have never sinned and then we forget uh, verse 9 that says we have confessed as forgiving us that we're free now that we're righteous now that we're a child of we're children of god now doesn't mean that we have never sinned that's why paul the apostle said this is a worthy saying and it is worthy of all acceptation that christ jesus came into this world to save who tell me out loud to save sinners and then he said of whom i am chief 
He said, I cannot brag. I cannot say I have never seen since I was born. I was injurious. I was blasphemous. I was a terrible person. But the joy is he has forgiven me and he has put me into the ministry. And the blood of Jesus Christ has become the propitiation and the atonement for my sin. And so after you are forgiven, verse 10, you cannot come and brag and say, I have never seen, I have not seen. If you do that, you make him a liar and the word is not in us. Those are the words we're studying today and I pray the Lord will give us understanding that will make us uh, go in the direction that the Lord himself has appointed for us in Jesus name. I'm dividing this study to three parts. Number one, the provision and the possibility of full redemption. The provision and the possibility of full redemption. Number two, the pretense and pride of familiar religionists. Religionists uh, who just uh, pretend uh, we know their pride and then we know their false profession and their pretense. And then point number three is the promise and the power of our faithful redeemer. Number one is the provision and possibility of full redemption. Let's come back to first John chapter one and I'm reading the latter part of verse seven. It says in verse 7, And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Obviously, you understand, there's a lot there. The blood of Jesus Christ. Without the blood, there'll be no salvation. Without his death for us, there'll be no salvation. There's no way for God to forgive us without somebody paying the penalty for the sins we have committed. Because God is just. And God is holy. And God is righteous. And God has said, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Until Christ, the sinless one, came and died for us. Nobody else could have died for you. Moses could not have died for us. And Joshua could not have died for us. David could not have died for us. Even Abraham could not have died for us. Because if they died, they would die for their own sin. Because the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And it says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the only one that could die for another is the one that didn't have any penalty of himself to pay. Any punishment to bear. Any death to undergo. That's why the only one who can save, there's no other name given among men whereby we can be saved but the name of Jesus behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world no other person could have done that that's why it says over here is the blood of Jesus Christ then it mentions his son what kind of son is that? Is the divine son. What kind of son is that? Is the sinless son. Is the spotless son. Is the pure purified son. Is the one that never knew any sin. But then he came to this life and he even said, which of you convinces me of sin? And it is the blood of such a pure savior. A righteous savior. And it is the blood of such a sinless savior that can cleanse us from all sin. That's why it says the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from. And then the last two words in that verse 7, tell me out loud. Tell me out loud. All sin. There are some people that do not have the understanding of the strength and the power. In the blood of Jesus, the efficacy in the blood of Jesus, their own Jesus is so weak. And the blood they claim to uh, plead is so weak that all sin cannot be cleansed away. But you see, the redemption that Christ has purchased for us is complete redemption. Uh, look at Isaiah chapter 53. While the prophet was still looking for that he is coming, he is coming. The one that will redeem us. The one that will cleanse us. The one that will forgive us he is coming. And then this is the way he describes uh, the efficacy of his death and his the power what he will do Isaiah chapter 53 I'm reading from verse 4 surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows yet we did esteem him stricken smitten of God and afflicted smitten of God what does that mean we should have been smitten because of our sin already you have heard the soul that sinneth it shall die but Jesus Christ came to take our place and because he came to take our place it says over here is meeting of God look at verse 5 but he was wounded for our transgression 
he was wounded for our transgression. You know, there are many people that read that and they pass over that because all they're looking for is the last part of that verse. Look at this in verse 5. He was wounded for our transgressions and he was bruised for our iniquities. Two times he tells us we had iniquities and Christ bore that. And we had transgression and Christ bore that. He says the chastisement of our peace was upon him. Uh, he was chastised. He was beaten. And he was, uh, he was suppressed. Why? Because of our sins. So that we can have peace with God. Look at that, that verse. And with his tribes, tell me the rest. We're healed. There are many people, that's all they concentrate on. With his stripes, we're healed. But listen, you could be sick and even die of sickness and go to heaven. But you cannot have sin and go to heaven. There are many people, the only thing they emphasize, with his stripes, we're healed. They care for the body. And the body is only here for a few years. And then after that, the body dies and then is buried in the grave. But the soul that lives forever. And what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? And that's why it's, that's why you should concentrate first of all on the very fact that he was wounded for your transgression. And that he was bruised for your iniquities. Look at verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. So nobody can say, no, I have no sin to be cleansed. I don't need Jesus Christ. I don't need his salvation. I'm all right. Uh, my mind is as plain like this. I don't, uh, you know, wish anybody evil. I just, you know, go my way and do my... You cannot say that. All we like sheep have gone astray. And then it says, we have turned everyone to his own way. You know, it said it the first time and the next line is very clear. It's, it's not saying that all have seen. I come short of the glory of God. But look at the latter part of that verse and the Lord has laid on him tell me what's right what the rest there he has laid on him the iniquity of us all that's what Jesus did he bore the punishment of our sin he bore the shame of our sin and when you turn away from that sin you turn to the Lord you turn to the Savior he will forgive you he will change your life and then he has the ability to cleanse he cleanses it's not just that you know he forgives as you know i've said uh, many people listen and praise god i'm forgiven praise god i'm forgiven and they do not they, they don't have the power to live in newness of life in ezekiel chapter 36 here is the promise the lord had uh, you know given a long time that uh, christ now came to fulfill look at ezekiel chapter 36 i'm reading from verse 25 in verse 25 5 it says then will I sprinkle clean water upon you and ye shall be clean. It says the blood of Jesus that cleanseth us, cleanseth us from all unrighteousness. And here is the promise the Lord is saying I will sprinkle clean water upon you and ye shall be clean. It says from all your filthiness everything, everything that is filthy in the sight of God, everything that is defiling in the sight of God, with, from all your filthiness will I cleanse you. And then it goes on to say, from all your idols I will cleanse you. And then it says in verse 26, a new heart also will I give you. You see verse 25 is talking about our salvation. It's talking about our forgiveness. It's talking about uh, setting us free from all the things that are filthy, defiling. But now verse 26 is saying, yes, it's easy to forgive the past. Uh, you know, God does that. And it's easy to uh, kind of uh, wash you from all the filthiness of the past. What if you still have the heart that tends to want to go back into the mud and go back into defilement? Then you'll be dirty again. But it says, number one, I'll save you. I'll forgive you. And I will take all the filthiness away. Now, your heart is the one that has the wanting to the desire, the propensity and the leaning to want to go back to the mud again and go back to that defilement again. Therefore, I'll do something in verse 26. This is your sanctification now. A new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. I will take away the stony heart, you know, the old heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. You see the promise of what God says he will do. I pray the promise will be yours in Jesus name. It's says in verse 25 i'll save you i'll forgive you i'll wash you 
I'll make you clean. I'll take all the idols and the filthiness away. And then he says in verse 26, I'll do more than that. I'll give you a new heart. I'll sanctify you. I'll purify you. I'll make you holy. The, the thing that is inside you, wanting to go back into the mud again, I'm going to remove that kind of heart and give you a new heart. Salvation, verse 25. Sanctification, verse 26. Look at verse 27. I will put my spirit within you. That's baptism in the Holy Ghost. The people of the Old Testament they were looking forward to this glorious time that will come when salvation will be real, when sanctification will be genuine, and when the power, the baptism, the infilling, the indwelling of the Holy Ghost will be so real that it strengthens us from within. It says in verse 27, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. The blood of Jesus now has, uh, you know, affected that in our lives as we believe the Lord. If you have not, the opportunity is just today. The Lord will do it for every one of us in Jesus' name. In Romans chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 23. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. For all have seen and come short of the glory of God. All have seen and come short of the glory of God. But look at this in verse 24. Being justified freely by his grace being justified freely by his grace nobody can say well i don't have money to buy salvation you don't have you need money i don't have a, you know good works i'm not good enough to buy salvation you don't need anything being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in christ jesus whom god has set forth in his uh, to be a propitiation that's atonement that's covering that's cleansing through faith in his blood through faith in his blood. There's some people that say, well, we're following Jesus Christ. We look at his perfect life and we try to copy his perfect life. That will not save you. We're not saved just by his life. We're saved by his death. He had to become a substitute. He had to become the final sacrifice. He had to share his blood for us. Then that's why it says, you have faith in his blood to declare his righteousness, I say, for the remission of the sins that are past. Underline that in your Bible. Remission, removal, forgiveness of the sins that are past. There are some people that you know deceive themselves. So they say God has forgiven them totally. And when they you tell them to explain the word totally, they said He has forgiven their past sins. He has forgiven. Not that He is forgiven. He has forgiven already their present sins. Then He has forgiven their future sins. Therefore, they have the license to do anything and go astray. They don't understand the grace that brought salvation has appeared unto all. And that grace teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly laws we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world they, they don't understand that they say that they'll keep on sinning because they have all been forgiven whatever sins they will commit you deceive your soul if you are if you are like that and then you might end up in hell fire if you don't uh, change uh, that uh, concept it says to declare i say in verse 26 at this time, it's righteousness that she might be just and the justifier of him that believes in Jesus. You turn away from your sin and therefore he forgives you. And then you put your faith, your confidence and your trust in the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses from all unrighteousness. Romans chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 8. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it says, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's why he died. He had to die for us while we were yet sinners. If you could clean up yourself, clean enough for heaven, Christ will not need to die. If you could perfect your life by yourself without the help of Christ, whether the atonement of Christ, your Christ would not need to have died. But it says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly much more than being now justified by his blood understand that by his blood uh, the blood of an animal cannot do that 
and the blood of a sacrifice that some people are still offering today cannot do that and of course the holy communion some people say that when they serve the holy communion that wine becomes the real blood of jesus christ uh -uh, it cannot do that it's the real blood of the real jesus that cleanses us it says justified by his blood we shall be saved from wrath through him in verse 10 for if when we were enemies we were reconciled to god by the death of his son the death is what uh, brought the blood out and as the blood that cleanses us from all unrighteousness it says uh, now we're reconciled to god by the death of his son much more being reconciled we shall be saved by his life after that reconciliation after reconciliation after salvation after redemption we shall be saved by his life colossians i'm reading from chapter 1 verse 20 Colossians chapter 1, we're looking at verse 20. The blood of Jesus, what it has done and what it has accomplished and what you need to place your faith, your trust in. It is the blood, the blood of Jesus Christ that is efficacious and strong enough to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Colossians chapter 1, reading from verse 20. It tells us in verse 20, and having made peace through the blood of his cross. You see that? It's all over, all over. Salvation is through the blood. Peace is through the blood. Purity is through the blood. And if you're going to have reconciliation with God, it's through the blood. The hope of eternal life is through the blood. That's why he's telling us over and over in every part of every part of the scriptures and having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself by him i say whether they be things on in earth or things in heaven and you who are sometimes alienated and the enemies in your mind by wicked works yet are seen now reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight is the blood of jesus that does that that is able to cleanse us is able to uh, wipe all those sins away he wipes the remembrance of them away he also wipes the power of that sin away that by the grace of god with the efficacious application of the blood of the lamb now we're, we're free in our conscience the guilt is no more there it's taken away by the blood of the lamb condemnation is no more there it's taken away by the blood of the lamb and the weakness of the past you know temptation comes and you could not overcome and temptation struck at you and could not overcome all that weakness the blood of the lamb has taken that away now you are saved that's redemption that's forgiveness that's salvation that's conversion and i pray that if it has not happened yet it will happen to you in jesus name because you know just coming to church will not get you to heaven being a member of the church any church will not get you to heaven and uh, you know whatever it is you are born in you know a christian family you've been reading the bible you've been singing the hymns and all that that is not enough you've been baptized and confirmed that's not enough and you're doing some kind of duty in the household of faith that's not enough but the cleansing of the blood of the lamb there must be a particular day you can say it was at this particular day and this particular month of year this particular year i went to the lord and i confessed my sins to the lord and i trusted jesus christ that he died for me and i was saved you can refer to that stage you can refer to that place you can refer to that date you can refer to that time and you'll say that was the time i was born again that's very important because if you are just coming to the church and you know you're turning over a new leaf and you're trying to change and you're trying to copy other people you're trying to walk the way we walk and bend the way we bend and fold your hand the way we fold our hands and you know whatever it is you are doing that's not enough but a definite experience of salvation that will say it happened at this time in this way i can take you to the place i can take you to the time when the lord did that for me if it has not happened i pray it will happen give me a good amen over there in uh, hebrews chapter 9 i'm reading from verse 12 hebrews chapter 9 verse 12 it says neither by the blood of goats and cows 
but by his own blood. You see that? It, your salvation doesn't come by the blood of animals. And if there's any organization, any fellowship, or any fraternity, or any kind of synagogue, or any kind of uh, shrine, or any kind of religious assembly, seal offering, a dose, a ghost, and animals today, is a waste of time. It's even worse than a waste of time. It's terrible deception. Because it says, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place having obtained eternal redemption for us eternal redemption for what does that mean that is redemption until the very end of time there's no other sacrifice there's no other redemption he has done it all is the final sacrifice that he has suffered and has obtained that eternal redemption for us in verse 13 for he by the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies uh, the, uh, to the purifying of the flesh that's the old covenant how much more how much more how much more shall the blood of christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without sports to god purge your conscience from dead works is going deeper now. He's spoken about just cleansing us, just washing us. He's, he's spoken about you know forgiving us. Now he's talking about even purging the conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Actually, the people of the Old Testament were uh, they were looking forward to this the time when uh, the final sacrifice will be made and when they will be redeemed from all the iniquity and they waited and waited and waited until Christ came. Let me show you what they are waiting for in uh, Psalm 130. Psalm 130. And I'm reading here from verse 8. And he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. They were looking forward to the fulfillment of that promise. And it never came. It never came. It, they, were, they were expecting this prophet might do it. That priest might do it. And that uh, person might do it. But it never came. He shall redeem Israel from all his iniquity. And eventually Christ came. Praise the Lord Christ has come. I said, praise the Lord Christ has come. What they were looking forward to, who will do this? Who will do this? He shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. He came and now it is done. And now that you believe, as you believe on him, he saves you. As you believe on him, he sanctifies you, he purifies you, and he purges you, he makes the change, a total change in your heart, in your life, in your soul, in your spirit. In Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 14. Titus chapter 2, verse 14. Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity. You remember what we read in Psalm 130, verse 8? He shall redeem Israel from all his iniquity. Now it's Christ that they were looking forward to. And now Christ has come. Calvary has taken place. Jesus Christ has died for us. He has shed his blood for us. Who gave himself for us. That he might redeem us from all iniquity. Not redeem them. The Israelites, Paul the apostle was writing. And he's writing now to the Gentile people. The Gentile church. And he's saying it's not just Israel now. Now, behold, the Lamb of God will take it away the sin of the Jews. No, of the world, everyone. So that blood is efficacious for you and for me. It says to redeem us from all iniquity and to purify. You see that? The salvation, a sanctification. This is full redemption. This is full salvation. That it forgives you, but it doesn't just forgive you and leave you as weak as you were. It strengthens you now. So that there will be inner victory. It strengthens you. There will be inner righteousness. It strengthens you that there is inner purging. It says and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. You know, when we eventually get to heaven, you know the, the praise we're going to offer in heaven is the praise of the fact that we are washed, we are cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. Revelation chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 5. Revelation chapter 1 verse 5 and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead. Then it says, and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us. Look at this. And washed us from our sins in his own blood. When you get to the end of time, 
And when you are about to cross over, you will not remember, you know, I did this, I did this, I built house, I got money, I got uh, clothes, I got cars, I got property and all. All that will not matter. When you are breathing your last breath here on earth, the only thing that will matter unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Look at chapter 5 of Revelation. Revelation chapter 5 and see what the saints in heaven be glorifying the Lord for. The cleansing he has given us. The forgiveness he has given us. The redemption he has given us. The full salvation he has given us through the blood. And remember that is the most important thing you can have on the face of the earth. While you are here, Revelation chapter 5 and I'm reading from verse 9. And he sang, and he sang a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us. You see that? And these are, you know, saints of God, redeemed of the Lord, singing in heaven. You have redeemed us to God by thy blood. By thy blood. That, that, that's so important. The blood of Jesus is out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and has made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. I pray you'll be among them in Jesus name. We're looking at chapter 7 and verse 9. Revelation chapter 7 verse 9. After this I beheld and lo a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the lamb clothed with white robes. What made their robes white is the blood. Are you washed in the blood of the lamb? And is your robe clean and white washed in the blood of the lamb? Then he goes on to say, a clothed with white robes and palms in their hands and cried with a loud voice saying, salvation to our God, which seated upon the throne and unto the lamb and all all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts that the four living creatures fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God. Look at what he said and said, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. And everybody said, Amen. Look at verse 13 and one of the elders and Answered and said unto me, Watch at these that are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? Look at verse 14. And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, trial, trouble, and testings, and have washed their robes and made them white. Tell me how. In the blood of the Lamb. You see, even as you get to Revelation, that is what the Lord is telling us. That it is that uh, blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses. It is that blood that washes. We're saved, we're sanctified, and we're kept clean and kept holy. And we're kept strong and victorious through the cleansing and the washing of that blood. Let's come to First uh, John chapter 1. First John chapter 1. We've looked at uh, verse 7 because it says, If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Now we come to point number two the pretense and the pride of familiar religionists. The pretense and the pride of familiar religionists. Look at verse 8. Religious people, here, here they are. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. There are people to start with that will say that they have no sin. Those ones, uh, they might be religious or philosophical, but they deceive themselves. But then there are other people, most uh, preachers and most readers and most religious people reach that verse in isolation. And they interpret that verse in isolation. They just quote, if we say we have, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. First stop. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and the word and his word is not in us. Full stop. They don't have any connection with the verse that went before. 
and no connection with the verses that go after and no connection with other parts of scripture in isolation they read that in isolation they, they, uh, they interpret that and they deceive themselves and mislead their hearers those deceive religious people use or misuse these verses of scripture to justify their living in sin that is habitually living in sin without any hope of ever being clean ever being free but you see that interpretation is not acceptable as you look at the whole of first john look at it with me in verse uh, in verse 7 latter part of verse 7 the blood of jesus christ his son cleanses us from all sin therefore you cannot uh, use verse 8 to justify we will always be sinners we will be committing sin habitually continually consistently forever and ever there's no time we're going to be free from sin no that's not what he's saying and look at verse 9 if we confess our sins he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness if you just say you know if we say we have no sin we deceive ourselves you must connect it with the others you're saying that so that you can go to god for confession and for repentance and for cleansing that the blood of jesus will change your life look at chapter 2 verse 1 my little children these things are right unto you that ye sin not that's the purpose of the epistle. The purpose is not for us to just keep on sinning, keep on sinning and say, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and truth is not in us. The purpose of the epistle is to make us realize, yes, we were sinners. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that drives us to Christ. We confess our sins to the Lord and we repent and turn away from that sin. And then we have the trust and faith in the blood of Jesus Christ and we're cleansed. And look at this in verse, two, verse chapter 2 verse 1 and if any man sin you know that word if is very significant it's saying if by carelessness you sin it says if by not watching you sin it says if you were surprised and taken unawares and then you sin it didn't say and when any man sin as if, you know, when any man sin, everybody will sin, even after conversion, keep on sinning, and when you sin, this is the solution. No, he didn't say when. He said if, and if any man sin, suddenly you are surprised into that. We have an advocate with the Father, Christ Jesus, the righteous. Uh, let's look at chapter 3. Chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 5. And we know, and ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Who so ever abided in him tell me what happens sinneth not so if you just uh, quote uh, chapter 1 verse 8 if we say we have no sin we deceive ourselves and truth is not in us no you're misinterpreting that thing if you interpret it to mean that we will we'll all be sinning every time it says no in fact it says uh, whosoever sinneth whosoever abideth in him sinneth not that's verse 6 whosoever sinneth has not seen him, neither known him. The one that is uh, using first, uh, first John chapter one verse eight, uh, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and therefore they keep on sinning habitually, continually, every time. It says that uh, those people are misinterpreting the word because whosoever abideth in him sinneth not, whosoever sinneth has not seen him, neither known him. Let's come to verse eight. Verse eight: He that committeth sin is uh, what tell me out loud of the devil if you're still living in sin you're still lying you have your part in labor that burns with fire and brimstone you're still committing fornication adultery you're still stealing stealing money and stealing that money anywhere whether you steal it in your office or you steal it in your home or you steal it anywhere if you're still stealing if you're dying that condition you'll go to hell forever five minutes in hell you will forget all the enjoyment you had in sinning and one hour in hell uh, you, there'll be no remembrance of any pleasure you had in sin and we're not talking of hell for one hour one year ten years a hundred years a thousand years a million years a trillion years on and on and on hell is an everlasting place and if you're going to escape that hell you come to the lord jesus christ you are cleansed in the blood of the lamb and it says he that committed sin is of the devil for the devil sinner from the beginning for this 
purpose the son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil look at verse 9 whosoever whosoever is born of God does not commit sin well don't just you know take for granted we're all sinners no we're not all sinners and we'll go to the Lord if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us and then to cleanse us and he breaks the power of that sin that that sin will not control your life anymore because whosoever is born of God does not commit sin for his seed remaineth in him and he cannot sin look at that that strong language he cannot sin while Christ lives in him while he's covered in the blood of the lamb while he's looking very seriously at the promises of God and he's standing on the promises he cannot sin because he's born of God look at chapter 5 verse 18 chapter 5 verse 18 you know the people that say nobody is perfect nobody is perfect everybody is sinning because if we say we have no sin we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us you're misinterpreting that verse you must look at the purpose of the whole epistle and understand that the epistle was written that you will not sin and the power to live above sin the lord will give you in jesus name don't you see that woman that was brought to jesus christ taking adultery in the very act and the pharisees said look at what this woman will cut her in the very act and the law of moses said she'll stone her what do you say and jesus was writing on the ground and eventually he lifted up his eyes and he said he that has no sin among you they had not been forgiven they were not saved they were hypocritical for the seasons so that says, let him count the first stone and they went away one by one and jesus said woman as no man condemned you when are your accusers and she said no man and then jesus said neither do i condemn you I condemn your adultery, I condemn your fornication, I condemn your stealing, I condemn your evil, but you as a sinner, if you want forgiveness, yes, I'm going to forgive you. Neither do I condemn you for the sin of the past, now in the future, go and sin no more. That's salvation. Anything less than that is no salvation. Look at chapter 5 and verse 18. Chapter 5 verse 18, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. John the beloved said, we know. Don't mind the people that take my verse. That's what John is saying that misinterpret what I've written in chapter 1 verse 8. But we know. Those who know the Lord know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself and that wicked one toucheth him not. He'll not touch you in Jesus name. Come back to chapter 1. Now that you understand what chapter 1 is saying, what uh, all the other parts are saying, look at verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. What's that saying? It's saying in verse 7. It said in verse 7, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. And then somebody writes this one and says, no, I don't need cleansing. Because I have no sin. That's the person John is talking about. That he is, he doesn't want to apply the blood of the lamb to cleanse his sin. He doesn't want to go to the Lord for forgiveness. He is proving that, you know, he has never sinned in his life. So he doesn't need forgiveness. He doesn't need salvation. That's why John said, ah, you are, de you are deceiving yourself. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Who are those kinds of people? Let me show show you we're looking at proverbs chapter 30 proverbs chapter 30 you'll find that the people that say that you will say we have no sin those who are deceiving themselves in a proverbs chapter 30 i'm reading here from verse 12 proverbs chapter 30 and we're looking at verse 12 there is a generation that are pure in their own eyes that's a problem a generation of people a congregation of people assembly of people there is a generation that are pure in their own eyes and they have not been washed from their filthiness those are the people they have not been cleansed by the blood of the lamb and they have not uh, come for the efficacious uh, powerful mighty strong cleansing of the blood of the lamb and yet they say they are clean in their own eyes and they appear pure in their own eyes those are the deceivers and uh, look at first uh, samuel chapter 15 first samuel chapter 15 i'm reading here from verse 13 first samuel chapter 15 and we're reading from verse 
verse 13. The people who say, you know, they have not, they have not sinned. Therefore, they don't need forgiveness. And sometimes uh, somebody has known the Lord before. Now he's a backslider and he's uh, doing something wrong. And then you challenge him, brother, you know, uh, this is backsliding. You've gone astray. You've gone away from the Lord. I say, uh-uh, don't tell me that. I'm all right. I know my heart. And I know how God deals with me. I know my relationship with God. You interview them. You talk to them. You try to correct them. You try to say, brother, this is wrong. Sister, this is wrong. This way will lead to a... No, no, no. Don't, don't, don't tell me about hell. I'm going to heaven. I'm all right. And let me show you. In First Samuel chapter 15. And I'm reading here from verse, uh, from verse 13. First Samuel chapter 15. We're looking at verse 13. And Samuel came to Saul. And Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. That's like saying, I'm all right. I'm pure. I'm righteous. I'm great. I'm doing well. I performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, what meaneth then this bleating of the sheep in my ear and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? And Saul said, Oh, they have brought them uh, from the Amalekites, for the people spared the, whole, the, the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God. And the rest we have utterly destroyed. No problem. We're all right. We've done well. Everything is okay. And God was sorry sorrowful about Saul. And Samuel was sorrowful about Saul. And everybody knew that Saul was wrong, except Saul himself. He said, I'm still alright. Those are the people. If we say we have no sin, after we are backslidden, after we have gone astray and we have done something terrible, something we shouldn't have done, and yet we see our conscience. We had in our conscience so that we can continue in evil. And we we'll say we're alright. But you know that Saul, he died eventually in his sin. He died eventually in his backsliding and uh, it's uh, unfortunate for him that he couldn't see the face of the Lord anymore because you know he just uh, he wasted his life and there are many people like that when the word of God is coming to you and you have a chance to repent for you to go back to Calvary and to go back to the cross and say yes I know I've done something wrong but you want to justify yourself you know people know that I'm a brother they know that I'm a sister even though that thing happened if I confess and I accepted that then they'll be looking at me as if ah so you did something like that so to preserve my name and to preserve my testimony and to preserve my you know relationship with the people i won't accept with anybody anytime even when i'm praying quietly or silently or praying a lot i won't allow anybody to suspect that there's anything wrong with me i say i'm all right you will die in your sin like that and go to hell that's what happened to Saul. let's look at some 36 some 36 i'm reading from verse 1 it says the transgression of the wicked says within my heart there is no fear of god before his eyes he flatters himself in his own eyes until his iniquity be found to be hateful he flatters himself he's saying i'm all right i'm all right and yet it's not all right jeremiah chapter 2 i'm reading from verse 22 jeremiah chapter 2 we're looking at verse 22 for though thou watch thee with nita and take thee much soap yet than iniquity is marked before me says the lord how canst thou say I have not I have not uh, I am not polluted so God, God is saying in verse 22 he says your sin is so much and it's so dirty that it's even difficult to find soap that will wash you and you'll be clean and yet you are saying I have not polluted myself how canst thou say I am not polluted I have not gone after bearing See thy way in the valley. Know what thou hast done. Thou hast a swift dromedary traversing their ways. And the Lord was uh, telling them that they had done evil. But they were saying they were flattering themselves. No, I'm all right. I've not done any bad sin. Are you like that? You're committing sin in the secret. And then you are covering up because you have some skill, you have some ability. And you, are, you, know, you can preach, you can you know, take the Bible. We know all that. You know, the Bible, we have known all this many years is in our head is in our mind and you can coach this and coach that but you know you're a sinner 
You know you're a backslider. You know you are not living right. If you died today, you are not sure of eternal life. You are not sure you are going to go to heaven. That's why we need to listen to these words and not be like a, a fake person or just a pretending religion is so that by the grace of God, the Lord will cleanse us through and through. I said the Lord will cleanse us through and through. There's no reason to pretend. What, what are we pretending about? When you were born into this world, you didn't know anybody. And when you came to this church, who did you know? You came by yourself. And you are staying here by yourself. Why is it you are forgetting the purpose you came? The purpose you came is to make this way the gate to heaven. So that your life will be clean. And when Christ comes, you'll go with the Lord in Jesus' name. We're looking at Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 33. Look at verse 33. Why trimest thou thy way to seek love? Therefore, as thou also taught the wicked ones thy ways. Hey, these are people, they also teach other people to be kind of insensitive to the spirit of God. Insensitive to the preaching of the word of God. Because, you know, that, that man there is backsliding and their friend, their friend knows he's backsliding. And the people who are very close to him, they know he's backsliding. And even when he's committing his own sin with impunity, as if there's no consequence, I'll just do it. You're teaching other people to commit iniquity like that to you, and day to day I'll be pretending as if you, he is alright, I'm alright. He says you know all the things he's doing, and sometimes when he steals the money, he even gives me part of the money, and he says you know, I got it again, and you know, you can have this one. If he can do it, and he's feeling that he's still a Christian, maybe I can get the money from him and spend as well. It says uh, you teach the wicked ones to do evil. Look at verse 34. Also, in thy skirts is found the blood of the souls of the poor innocents. I have not found it by secret search, but upon all these, yet thou sayest because I am innocent. It says, you're a sinner, you're a backslider, you're doing evil. And yet to say, I am innocent, surely his anger shall turn from me. It says, no judgment, no hellfire, there's no punishment, no chastisement. His anger will turn away from me because I am innocent. Behold, I will plead with thee because thou sayest I have not sinned. Those are the people John is talking about. He's saying that uh, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And these pretending people, they said, no, I'm all right. There's nothing like that at all. And everybody knows the man is guilty. The woman is guilty. Look at Matthew chapter 27. I'm reading from verse 24. Matthew chapter 27. And we're reading from verse 24. It says in Matthew 27, 24, here it says, When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that uh, rather a tumult uh, was made, he took water and he washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this uh, just person. See ye to it. Can you imagine that? He had the, he had the knowledge that Jesus Christ had not done anything wrong. And he knew that it was for envy and jealousy they delivered him. And when he could not, uh, you know, have a backbone to stand and say no. According to what I've seen, this is the right thing. I cannot condemn this man to death. And so he brought water and he washed his hand. Pilate, what are you washing up? You're washing your hand. There must be something in your hand. Why are you washing your hand with water? And uh, you know, even what he did had no meaning anymore. And then he said, I'm innocent from the blood of this just person. And then answered all the people and said, His blood be upon us and, all our, ch and on our children. Then released he Barabbas unto them. And when he had scourged Jesus, I saw Pilate who said, He's innocent. I thought you said, it's a just man. What are you scourging him for? And yet the man said, I'm innocent. Those, those are the people, John, the beloved is talking about. They say they're innocent. They say everything is all right, and yet everything is all wrong. I pray you'll not be like that in Jesus' name. That you will understand that the blood of Jesus is available. And as you look at your life, and the Spirit of God is convicting you of sin and of unrighteousness, you come to Calvary and you'll be cleansed and purged and purified. In Luke chapter 16, I'm reading from verse 15. Luke chapter 16, verse 15. 
He tells us and he said unto them, Ye are they will justify yourselves before men. Those are the people. We have no sin. We're all right. We've not done anything wrong. And the Lord said, You are they that, that justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. And so you understand, John was saying, The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And let no man rise up like Saul in the Old Testament, like Pilate in the New Testament, and say, we have no sin because if you say that you deceive yourself and the truth is not in you we come to point number three now point number three the promise and the power of our faithful redeemer the promise and the power of our faithful redeemer it's telling us in first john chapter one first john chapter one and i'm reading from verse nine if we if if we confess our sins is saying now if you come out of that deception if you come out of that flattery if you come out of that uh, you know hardening of your conscience and shielding yourself from being discovered and you put on a smile and you put on a good attitude and see if you know i'm okay would i be happy like this if i wasn't all right would i be smiling like this if i wasn't all right and would i be walking confidently among the children of god if i, if I wasn't walking right okay you're a christian you have the spirit of god you can you can tell you go and ask god the thing that when when they say that they push you forward they say well, you're a christian you know if i'm if i'm all right you ought to know if you don't it means you don't have the spirit of god i know i'm all right now if you come out of that out of that deception if you come out of that self-flattery and then you say i'm going to confess my sin before the lord i'm going to turn away from my sin then the lord will forgive you i said the lord will forgive you it says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If from a deep sense of guilt and unrighteousness and utter helplessness, we confess and forsake our sins and plead for his mercy and for his pardon because of Christ who has died for us, then he is faithful to forgive. What does that mean? Because he gave a promise that he will forgive, then he is faithful. He will fulfill that promise and he is just. What does that mean that he is just? Because the penalty of our sin had been paid by Christ and justice demands that that debt can only be paid once and since Christ has paid that price, the penalty, we will not pay that penalty again. We confess and we forsake and we trust him. We lean on him. We have confidence in him. We say, he died for me. It was for my sin. He died. Lord Jesus, I thank you. And because the penalty has been visited on him, then we are free. It makes God just because Christ has paid the debt and he has made atonement uh, to divine justice so that God can now be just and yet the justifier of repentant sinners and uh, of those who believe and uh, look at uh, proverbs chapter 28 proverbs chapter 28 reading here from verse 13 proverbs chapter 28 and we're reading from verse 13 it tells us in verse 13 he that covereth his sins shall not prosper the people that say no i don't have any sin the blood of jesus that's right for them but for me i'm all right i've never seen i don't have anything to be cleansed it says you are covering your sin you will not prosper and if you continue in that deception and flattery until you die you'll spend eternity in hellfire but then it says but whoso confesseth and forsaketh whoso confesseth and forsaketh it's not just okay i'm sorry i've not done right i'm sorry i see it now that i that's not okay and then you only confess but it's no forsaking of the sin you say you must confess and then forsake only then you will have the mercy of god isaiah chapter 55 i'm reading here from verse 6 and verse 7 isaiah chapter 55 verses 6 and 7 it says seek ye the lord 
while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way. That's how we get forgiveness. Not that we, con we commit sin and continue not sin. Just say, oh, yeah, forgive me, forgive me. And sometimes we do that to one another, you know. They say, ah, are you not a Christian? Are you not a believer? Forgive me. It's uh, Jesus said, if your brother sins against you and he comes to you, forgive me and repent seven times in a day that you forgive him. It, it comes with repentance. It comes with forsaking the sin. It's not just that, are you not a Christian? Okay, forgive me now. If uh, as God not forgiving you, forgive me now. Are you not? Uh, don't you believe the Bible? Forgive me now. That's not it. You confess and you forsake. And it is when you turn away from the sin and there's a new life, a new relationship, that's when the forgiveness will come. That's why it says in that verse 7, let the wicked forsake his way and the righteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord. Not just that to forsake your righteous ways, you return to the Lord. The commitment you made at the beginning, the consecration you made at the beginning, I will follow you. I will serve you until the end of my life. I'll be transparent. I'll be obedient and I will be you'll be my master, my Lord and my Savior. you return to the Lord and he will have mercy unto our God for he will have abundantly pardon. And that is what happens in Acts of the Apostles chapter 3. Acts of the Apostles chapter 3 and I'm reading from verse 19. Acts of the Apostles chapter 3. We're reading from verse 19. This is how the forgiveness comes. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Acts chapter 3 verse 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted. You see that? Repent ye therefore. We must turn away from sin. If we want the forgiveness of the Lord and be converted. Let there be a change of life, a transformation of your life that your sins may be blotted out. But there's no conversion, there's no change, no change of mind, no change of attitude, no change of action. I keep on doing the same thing. There will be no forgiveness, there will be no real salvation. But repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Verse 26, unto you first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. That's how that forgiveness comes. It turns us away from all our unrighteousness. In a second, uh, second Corinthians chapter 7. Second Corinthians chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 1. You see it had said in the previous, in the previous uh, verses. That is chapter 6. Look at chapter 6 verse 17. Then we're going to flow into chapter 7 verse 1. It says, uh, wherefore come out from among them. You see, you have a part to play. You're being with a gang of uh, people that are doing evil. Assembly of people committing iniquity. An assembly of deceivers deceiving themselves. And they're perpetrating the works of darkness behind the curtain. It says, wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate says the Lord, touch not the unclean thing. You see that? That is part of it and this God talking to us and I will receive you and will be a father unto you and you shall be my sons and my daughters says the Lord Almighty. Look at the verse that follows in chapter 7 verse 1. Having therefore these promises dearly beloved, what promises? I'll be a father unto you and ye shall be my sons and my daughters says the Lord. That's the promise. It says, since we have that promise dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh. We're not going to remain in sin and think that forgiveness will come, cleansing will come, salvation will come, restoration will come, sanctification will come. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. The Lord is able to save, save to the uttermost, is able to sanctify, sanctify to the uttermost. Second uh, Timothy, I'm reading from chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2, and we're looking at uh, verse 21. It says, if a man therefore purge himself from these, you check your life. Uh, don't take, uh, you know, just coming to church uh, for granted and reading the Bible for granted and calling the name of Jesus for granted. You check up your life, filthiness there uncleanness there, flattery there, pretense there, hypocrisy there, or stealing there, or you know, some shades of adultery, fornication there, all those things that are there, or maybe you're still in a, into the business
mysteries of pornography and you will check up all those things not just say you know, okay jesus christ is merciful he will cleanse us you will bring all those things before the lord and if uh, you know there's violence there there's you know anger there and all those things it says if a man therefore purge himself from this it shall be a vessel unto honor sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work then it says in verse 22 flee also used for laws not that you know i'm forgiven and then you stay in that evil thing it says you flee you run away from me you separate yourself from them but follow after follow righteousness and faith and charity and peace and with them that call on the lord out of a pure heart i pray the lord will purify our hearts in jesus name i said the lord will purify us in jesus name Ephesians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 25. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives. I don't know how many times you have read that, and yet there's no love in the family. Husbands, love your wives. I don't know how many times, you know, you yourself, you preach that uh, over there, but then you cannot love your wife, you cannot love your husband. I pray that, uh, you know, we'll not just be hearing the word of God in vain in Jesus' name. That this word, your wife will see the effect in your life. I said your wife will see the effect in your life. And your husband will see the effect in your life. And that, you know, angry attitude, angry disposition, always ready for a fight when there's nothing to fight about. All those things will vanish away. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any sort of thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And that's the plan of the Lord, and that's what he wants to do, and that's what he will do for every one of us. And remember, it's the blood of Jesus that accomplishes that. And the blood of Jesus is still mighty and powerful, and that blood cannot fail and will not fail in any one of our lives in jesus name hebrews chapter 13 i'm reading from verse 12 hebrews chapter 13 and we're reading here from verse 12 hebrews chapter 13 and we're reading from verse 12 it says in verse 12 wherefore jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered without the gate let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp bearing his reproach. Why do we need total cleansing and total forgiveness and total redemption and full salvation and real holiness of heart and life and real sanctification after, after salvation? Because look at verse 14, for here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. If your aim of reading the Bible is to get to that uh, heavenly land, is to get to that heaven eventually. If your aim of coming to the Bible study is to get to that heaven eventually. If your aim of being in this church is to get to that heaven eventually, see what happens here. It says, let us go to Christ. Let us go to him without the camp bearing his reproach because we do not have here a continuing city. We seek one to come and without holiness no man shall see the Lord. Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see the Lord and there's only one way to be pure, to be holy, to be righteous. The cleansing of the blood of Jesus. And as we come to the Lord today, he will do it for us in Jesus' name. We we'll rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer and let the cleansing of that blood be efficacious today. Understand, that blood has not lost its power. It will do that effective work in your heart, in your life today. And let us sincerely and wholeheartedly and transparently come before the Lord. If you're a sinner, tell the Lord I'm a sinner and he will forgive you and he will save you. If you are a backslider, I tell the Lord and be a backslider. He will forgive you and he will restore you. If you're a believer, tell the Lord to give you the strength and the cleansing of the blood and the strengthening of the inner man so that by the grace of God, you'll continue living a life that is to the glory of God. And if you see that you believe you are saved, but you know you are not sanctified, your heart is still, you know, is uh, having this propensity to evil and this tendency uh, to evil and, uh, you know, anger and 
all whatever is there internally even though you are not fighting the physical but in your heart you understand that this is not right you know and your conscience tells you every time is this what you call holiness is this what you call sanctification then you come to the lord the lord is waiting for you and he can cleanse you and wash you thoroughly today have you been to jesus for the cleansing power are you washed in the blood of the lamb are you fully trusting this hour in his grace and you washed in the blood of the lamb are you washed are you washed is in the soul cleansing blood of the lamb are your garments spotless are they white as snow are you washed in the blood of the lamb let it happen today the lord can do it for you he can save you and you know i was saved that day, that hour, that moment, and the Lord can purify you, sanctify you, make you holy, and you will know at that very point I trust in the blood of Jesus, He has cleansed me from all unrighteousness.